Welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, Liz and I have, uh, uh, are trying to encapsulate uh, over 150 years worth of uh, uh, labor history uh, into 90 minutes, uh, or three hours, I guess, but we, it's got to be in, uh, probably in 90 minutes, so we want to have uh, time for discussion. So, you know, bear with us uh, um, that we are, it was a very difficult task to, to try and identify what things need to be uh, talked about and what things, because history is full of details, and, and particularly labor history and the history of the Communist Party is full of lots of details, and really interesting and important details, right? But uh, from the perspective of the, of the Communist Party and how we view labor and, and building from the history of the labor movement and how it developed in, in, in the world and in particular Canada, uh, we've developed over the years a particular strategy and tactics uh, based on, uh, on on Leninist principles that you'll see emerge hopefully. Hopefully you'll see it emerge from our discussion. And so we're trying to focus the things that we talk about in, in this uh, lecture and, dis and following discussion on, on where uh, our tactics and strategies evolve from and why why are we still doing what we're doing today? So, um, we would have, this is going to be a little bit wordy and we apologize in advance. Uh, 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 so we're asking you to uh, write your questions down in your comments and, and we all have, we're, we're, we're determined to leave plenty of time for discussion at the end. So, if we're ready to go, here we go. Did I say enough? Okay. So, let's start with a quote. And I'm sure you'll all recognize this, that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight that each time ended either in the revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Of course, that's from, that's from the Communist Manifesto. And so it is. <laughs> and we understand that this is a dialectical struggle. Within the working class uh, are also internal struggles within the classes, within the ruling class and within the working class. We probably and definitely don't have enough time to examine this question in uh, detail in relation to the ruling class, but we shall and we hopefully will examine how this plays out within the working class in this historical look at the labor movement and the Communist Party. The Communist Party understands the importance of the working class in the revolutionary struggle to replace capitalism with socialism and ultimately communism. We often refer to the historical role of the working class as the only class capable of overthrowing capitalism. We also understand that the organized section of the working class the working or the trade union movement has the resources, organization, and the potential political understanding to lead this struggle. In this discussion, we are aiming to examine this position, look at how this political potential can be achieved. As communist activists, we all play leading roles in our unions. We strive to be leaders and fighters for better wages and working conditions and to defend the rights of our sisters and brothers in the workplace. In short, we are all pretty damn good trade unionists. However, there are a lot of pretty good, good pretty goddamn good <laughs> trade unionists who are not members of the Communist Party, but, we are, but are just as active and committed as we are, but do not see the working class as an instrument of social and economic change. Therefore, they are not likely to see why they should join the Communist Party and or enter the political struggle for overthrowing capitalism. Many of them probably believe that capitalism is okay if it's done nicer. How are we different? Why do we do what we do and why do we put so much time and energy into the working, into working in the trade union movement? Historically, there's been two kind of main trends in organized labor. Uh, in the organization of workers. The first work is to be organized were organized through guilds, uh, through their trades, which eventually evolved into craft unions and again organized by trades, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and so on. Most of you understand this, no need to explain it. 
The vast majority of workers toiling in industry were considered unskilled and could not join any existing craft unions. Early on, it was clear to revolutionary-minded peoples that there was a need for these workers to have their own organizations, and the concept of industrial organizations was arrived at. In the 19th century in Canada, the first mass organization representing workers were the Knights of Labor. They were early champions of the industrial form of unionism, embracing all workers, skilled and unskilled. They based their organizational principles and labor philosophy on Robert Owen's Grand National Consolidated Union from England. Although primarily aimed at workers, membership was open to anyone over the age of 18 years who worked or had any time worked for wages, except individuals who made a living manufacturing, selling, or handling intoxicating liquor. <laughs> <laughs> Doctors, lawyers, and bankers were also barred from membership. The leadership was officially opposed to using the strike weapon, but in the militancy of the membership spurred on by their terrible working conditions often resulted in them being the leading force in most of the great militant strikes of that period except for the battle, officially, except for the battle of the, for the eight-hour day, although many of them did play a major part in the struggle as well. Samuel Gompers described them as undertaking to wipe out the lines of industry and make one whole organization of all classes of labor. The craft unions we mentioned earlier were the main form of organization for workers at that time, but as we pointed out, they were restricted to those who had specific trade skills. The Knights of Labor tried to address the need to provide unskilled labor with organizational representation. The Knights of Labor played an important role in many of the political and social battles in the early 1900s and late 1800s. They had a well-developed class consciousness. They campaigned for funds to provide relief for workers involved in labor battles all around North America and the world. They were also directly involved in politics, fielding candidates in local elections across Canada. They did not follow any particular political party, but ran as independents, or perhaps with two or three of them together on slates, uh, with the locally organized electoral organizations. Unfortunately, the main blot on their history was a decidedly racist attitude towards Chinese and other immigrant labor. They played a major role in institutionalizing the racist two-tiered wage system for the Chinese which lasted for decades. They even initiated blacklists of businesses that employed Chinese and called for boycotts of these businesses. In the early part of the 20th century, craft unions became the main influence in organized labor and they basically ran the show, excluding the many thousands of unskilled workers. They were a direct descendant of the trade skills as of earlier centuries. In Canada, their represent, main representation was the Dominion Trades Congress, which is their central bar, uh, organization. In response to the debates and discussions initiated by the First International, revolutionary-minded workers began organizing a new kind of workers' organizations, more political in nature and decidedly anti-capitalist and pro-socialist. Most prominent and successful of these was the international workers of the world. But there were others as well, such as the Western Federation of Miners in Western Canada, which at one time was the dominant force in organizing industrial workers in BC and Alberta. They actually officially adopted as their own the entire program of the Socialist Party of America at their Denver convention in 1902. There were heated political debates that took place at this point between these organizations and the Dominion Trades Congress and the American Federation of Labor on the other. The, other, the main difference was the call for independent labor political action. The push was for the Dominion Trades Congress to break with the old line political parties and embrace socialism, which didn't happen. In 1905-1906, the IWW, the Western Federation of Miners, and the American Labor Union all joined forces. The history of the IWW all over North America is one of brave and heroic struggles with many martyrs to the class struggle. Fighters like Joe Hill, Frank Little, Wesley Everett, and so on, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and others. Hmm? 
Bill Haley? Yes, that's right. We could probably name hundreds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the historic label, la historic labor battles were led and won by the IWW, improving wages and working conditions for many thousands of workers. There were many books written about the IWW and their battles, and it would be useful and very interesting to look at the history, but, but we don't have time today. However, looking at the decline of anarcho-syndicalism anarcho and the influence of the IWW is worth taking a look at in conjunction with the Russian Revolution. That event brought to a head the simmering differences that have been debated for many years in the World Socialist Movement, and Canadian workers were not immune to these developments. It was in this period that the genesis of the Communist Party of Canada took place. The First World War brought to the fore one of the most divisive issues facing the socialists of the Second International over the question of war and peace. Significant sections of the Second International were prepared to take a nationalist position and support their native capitalists and imperialists in what was clearly another imperialist war. Many others who were true internationalists quite correctly pointed out that the workers would be killing workers and the only winners would be the capitalist system and imperialism. Ultimately, this division destroyed the Second International as an effective revolutionary socialist voice. To its credit, the IWW was opposed to the war. Canadian capitalists took full advantage of the war to ship thousands of young workers off to Europe to be slaughtered and used the draft laws to weed out troublemakers at home such as Ginger Goodwin and BC. And I'm sure there was others across the country. The leaders of the IWW split into two factions over whether to be a political movement, this was championed by Daniel de Leon, de Leon or to be simple and, uh, simply an economic job union. This battle waged for a number of years, through to the end of the war and through the Russian Revolution. It was never officially resolved within the organization and was a factor entering the major influence of the IWW. The IWW still has chapters all over the place. So there's still an existence as an organization. Despite the huge anti-war protests in Canada, the trades union movement, and I'm talking about the craft trades union movement, uh, made no noise or took any issue with the war officially. They neither supported or opposed it, uh, but they made no effort to resist the bloodbath that was killing many of their members. Although several provincial and local labor federations called for resistance to the draft, no official organized resistance took place, largely due to the lack of support from the Dominion Trades Congress. This almost resulted in several provincial federations withdrawing from the Dominion Trades Congress. In the West, there was a large anti-war resistance amongst workers, but there was no appetite for resistance from the Dominion Trades Congress and the American Federation of Labor. However, the Russian Revolution caught the workers' imagination as a major victory for the working class amidst the slaughter and carnage that was taking place in Europe. The name Lenin became well known to all workers in Canada. A number of trades and labor congresses across the country distributed Lenin's pamphlets and many workers proudly proclaimed themselves Bolsheviks. When the First World War ended and the imperialists turned their attention to destroying the new Soviet states, state, there were resolutions adopted across the country demanding that our troops be withdrawn from Russian territory and that all aggression and intervention be stopped. On the West Coast, where a lot of where all the soldiers were being mobilized to go to Russia through Vladivostok, um, the BC Federation of Labor had the same, did the same, but unfortunately took no direct action to prevent the export of war materials from the West Coast to Russia. Although some of the longshore individuals refused to have a war cargo, and several longshoremen had unfortunate accidents where artillery parts accidentally dropped into the water. <laughs> <laughs> there was great enthusiasm. We had this a wonderful presentation uh, from a, a friend of ours in Victoria about the Russian Revolution that was uh, at the, uh, you were there, you saw it at the, uh, uh, at the conference of the uh, 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 
Pacific Northwest Labor History Association. And they actually had uh, a rebellion in Victoria where the, the, the soldiers uh, from Quebec refused to get on the boat that was going to Vladivostok. They actually, there was shots fired and people were arrested. They were thrown in, in chains into the bottom of the ship and taken to Vladivostok where they were to be tried and executed. Uh, but the, the, the public uh, appetite for such a thing was, was so against that that they eventually ended up letting them all go free. But no, actually, no actual fighting took place. Uh, any of those people in Vladivostok, there is, a, there is a graveyard there with Canadian soldiers, but they all, most of them died from uh, syphilis and uh, influenza. <laughs> there was nobody actually involved in any armed struggle. Um, so, there was great enthusiasm for the new Soviet state. Oh, I think I did that. No, no. There was great enthusiasm for the new Soviet state and the weakening of the IWW as an organization left the field open for yet another attempt to organize industrial unions. Unfortunately, again, from outside the main labor movement, as the Dominion Trades Congress imposed industrial organizing. In 1919, the one big union, OBU, was formed as a joint project of the BC Federation of Labor and the most progressive elements of the Alberta Federation of Labor. Resolutions passed at the Calgary Conference demonstrated the revolutionary spirit of the founders, and they sent revolutionary greetings to the new Soviet Republic and to the Spartacus Party of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. They embraced the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat. These bold and provocative declarations <coughs> opened the new OBU <coughs> to wide and broad attacks from the capitalists who were extremely wary at that time of anything remotely revolutionary following the Russian Revolution. They were able to make the argument that the OBU was starting a revolution. The Winnipeg general strike and sympathetic strikes in Vancouver and other western cities were described as attempts to set up Soviets in Canada. The OBU was doomed before it was born. With, then, with the help of all the reactionaries, particularly those in the labor movement that was utterly broken, and many good militant unionists were once again on the outside of the main labor movement. At the, economic, the, the Winnipeg General Strike in 1919 was a good example of how quickly an economic struggle can lead to a political struggle. However, this heroic struggle was lost because of the anarcho-syndicalist line that a general strike would bring capitalism to its knees. In fact, that line left the workers defenseless when the state sent in the army to break the strike. These events are what ended the influence or contributed to ending the influence of anarcho-syndicalism in the Canadian trade union movement. The IWW and the OBU made the same fundamental mistake. They tried to combine a revolutionary political program with the tasks of an ordinary trade union, the fight for better wages and working conditions. They tried to be a political party and a trade union all in one package. A trade union cannot be a revolutionary party, although it may be a weapon for a revolutionary struggle. And I just wanted to point you to the, uh, which I think is the best document that I asked people to read is, is the, this one issued by the Trade Union Educational League, which is a, uh, with a, with a, a, a very good introduction by William Z. Foster, who had just returned from Third International when they wrote this. And it uh, is a <coughs> article by uh, Lasowski uh, talking about the Leninist tr uh, approach to trade union work. So the example of the Russian Revolution demonstrated to many revolutionary-minded activists that it was possible for workers to seize state power. This is an important, uh, important uh, concept that it was driven home. It was, that it was, it was possible for the workers to seize state power and build a socialist society and economy and to end exploitation. This fundamentally changed the outlook of labor activists who are struggling with the ideas faced by generations of labor activists before them, what the relationship should be between political action and trade union action. The ideas of anarcho-syndicalism were proving to be untenable, but the organizations had proven the power of organized labor. 
The ideas flowing from the Communist International put forward a more logical approach. The working class must have its own independent organizations to defend wages and working conditions and to represent the interests of workers in government and society. Communists must work within these organizations to build revolutionary understanding and to bring the working class into a revolutionary struggle. A significant number of trade union activists in Canada who were inspired by the Revo Russian Revolution began to take more interest in the revolutionary writings of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, and together with other revolutionary-minded members of the Socialist Party of North America and the Socialist Party of Canada came together to form the Communist Party of Canada, which was first known as the Workers' Party of Canada. This new party took an active role, advocating for the organization of industrial unions while also promoting a single, strong and united labor movement, including both craft and industrial unions. The party favored creation of a federated party of labor, of which our party would be a part of, along with other labor and progressive organizations, including all those committed to its policies and program for fundamental change. Uh, and there was a party formed, the Canadian Labour Party, uh, very short-lived, uh, but it embraced those principles. It fell apart with, uh, I guess, the, the main ideological struggle between uh, social democratic and communist uh, approaches to uh, work in the labour movement. That was uh, written by who? Let's, let's, the, the one that the Trade Union Education League one? No, 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 no. Well, I've got mine out of this, party yes. and it's also in the party history, too. Yeah. This who, who's the author of that? William Bennett, who was uh, one of the Bill first. Bennett. Bill Bennett. Old Bill. Boilermaker Bill. So builders, builders of BC. Yeah, Builders of British Columbia. This is basically, it, it, it doesn't specifically, it doesn't entirely deal with the history, labor history of British Columbia, but that's specifically, Bill, Bill Bennett was, was the uh, uh, editor of the party's press during the, the 30s, I guess, and early 40s. Um, anyways, it's a very good, very, very, very good book. No, no, the <laughs> no, not related at all. Although, yeah, we did have a premier, Bill Bennett, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the new party um, took an active role advocating for the organization of industrial unions while also promoting a um, single strong and united labor movement, including both craft industrial unions. Oh, I've read that one. I'm sorry, comrades. <laughs> the Trade Union Educational League, founded in 1921, took an active role in promoting the ideas of a Leninist approach to trade union. The pamphlet they issued in 1924, which is the one I held up, is a good blueprint for the principles still practiced today by Communist parties. The New Workers' Party of Canada and later the Communist Party followed this strategy and after some growing pains, firmly advanced along the path of organizing industrial workers. In the 1930s and early 1940s, <coughs> was the main era where these working classes advances took place. Prior to the Second World War, the new Soviet Union was making tremendous economic and social advances, which were becoming an example for Western workers. This was during the worst of the Depression years, and this example was inspiring thousands of workers to question the capitalist system and look to the socialist Soviet Union. The Communist Party's policy of working within the existing trade unions and at the same time working to bring all workers into unions was beginning to really take off. And as a result, the Communist Party itself was rapidly growing in numbers and in influence. At the same time that the unemployed were being herded into labor camps, communists and young communists worked to organize them into a union to fight for work and wages. This is a, another example of starting a, a struggle for economic reasons and it, we saw it quickly advance to a political struggle. The workers, uh, the relief camp workers union went on strike and quickly under the leadership of the Communist Party and I might add the white young communists, they turned that struggle into a highly political onto Ottawa Trek which was brutally crushed by the state and the RCMP in Regina. 
Um, I'm going to just switch over here a bit to part of Liz's thing because we, we kind of bridged over and I think she deals with this part better than me. <laughs> Until 1932, the Communist Party was the only revolutionary workers' party in Canada. It was recognized by both workers, employers, and governments as the workers' party whose aim was both reform and revolution and whose end goal was socialism. Furthermore, the Communist Party's working class internationalism and ties with the Communist parties around the world through the common turn, of which it was a member, made it a formidable enemy of employers and of capitalism in Canada. And a supporter and advocate of revolutionary movements and struggles around the world. From the beginning, this is a bit of a duplication, but I want to read it because I think Liz covers it very nicely. From the beginning, the party advocated and fought for unity of the working class including both revolutionary and reform trends. On the economic side, this meant calling for a single central federation of labor, including both industrial and craft unions. On the political side, it meant a federated labor party that would include the Workers' Party, and the, which was the early Communist Party, and the reformist trends in the labor movement to create a united front of struggle against the employers and capitalism. The Canadian Labor Party was the result. During its short life, the Canadian Labour Party was able to bring together the revolutionary and re reformist trends in the labour movement in a single federated party of labour, able to fight for an immediate workers' agenda. Throughout its short life, the Canadian Labour Party was a hotbed of struggle between the reformists and the revolutionaries, within the workers' party steadily gaining support among progressive workers. By 1928-29, the right-wing social reformists engineered a split based on their anti-communism and opposition to the growing support for the Workers' Party inside and outside the Canadian Labour Party. Many of them were involved in building the CCF, born four years later. There are interesting parallels here with the birth and initial aims and structure of Quebec Solidaire, which Comet Pierre will no doubt speak about tomorrow. During the 1920s, and especially during the 1929 crash, the party focused on organizing among workers, farmers, and the unemployed, many of them immigrants, for jobs, better wages, and conditions, reduced hours of work, unemployment insurance, universal public health care and education, and the protections for farmers against bankruptcy, including nationalization of the banks, protection of immigrants against exploitation and unjust deportations, and political rights, including free speech and assembly, workers right to free collective bargaining and to strike. The universal right to vote and more resulted in significant growth of the Communist Party's membership and in influence. The party's leadership of the Relief Camp Workers Union, the Aunt Ottawa Trek, and the fight for unemployment insurance had a huge impact. As our party history states, the Communist Party emerged from this period firmly established in the minds of Canadian workers as an unshakable champion of the rights and interests of the working class, the farmers, and unemployed. The party's fight to establish industrial unions in Canada was hands-on, with many of our party in the front lines of building the steel workers, auto workers, IBEW, the, uh, UE, mine mill, fish, CSU, IW, as I said, there's lots of them, lumber and saw, and many other unions. The Committee for Industrial Organizing, uh, Committee for Industrial Organizing, CIO, held its first meeting in Canada with the Hamilton Committee of the Communist Party, out of which was born the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, led by Communist Party organizers, Harry Hunter, Harry Hamburg, Dick Steele, and the McClure brothers, one of whom became the first president of the short-lived steel local at the FASCO in 1936. Slim Evans, Harvey Murphy, Harold Prochet, Dewar Ferguson, George McEachern, Bruce Magnuson, Jim Litterick, Cyril Prince, George Harris, Ross Russell, Jean Paré, right? right, and many others led to those organizing drives, which were the base of the modern trade union movement in Canada. J.B. McLaughlin. J.B. McLaughlin, thank you. <laughs> and surprisingly, the American Federation of Labor opposed the CIO's formation in the U.S. and accused the Canadian Trades and Labor Congress of splitting and raiding because of its strong support for the CIO. The TLC rejected the charge as interference in the affairs of the TLC and the Canadian trade union movement, and the organizing continued with growing momentum. 
but the issue of a sovereign and independent trade, trade, Canadian trade union movement had come to the fore once again. And um, I'll turn it over to Liz. Okay. You can go through that.